clicker for the? Um, I don't have it. I've not seen it. I'll call the May 6 Planning Commission meeting in order. Uh, will everyone please stand? And Commissioner Rosine, can you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Nice to see many faces out here that can help us with the pledge. It's been a while since we've been able to do that. All right, staff, roll call, please. All commissioners are present this evening. Great. This is uh, time for public comments where we uh, have items that are not on the agenda that are generally within the purview of the Planning Commission. If you wish to speak, please keep your comments to three minutes or less. And for those on the phone, you can call 949 270 8165. So those that are uh, watching remotely can call again. That's 949 270 8165. And again, this is on non agenda items. Are there anyone? Mr. Mosier, you can begin. Uh, thank you, Chair Wigand, members of the Planning Commission. My name, <clears throat> as I think you know, is Jim Mosier, and I have two non agenda comments tonight. Uh, the first one is to note that on March 27th, the City Council reviewed uh, your comments about the housing element update. And I noticed that attachment C in their uh, agenda staff report was a slightly early copy of the draft minutes for your previous meeting at which you discussed this. And it occurred to me that there's sometimes a very long interval between your meetings. And although there's a video available to review during that time, uh, draft minutes like these are very useful as a quick summary of what happened at your meetings. Uh, and I would suggest it would be a good idea to establish a mechanism where draft minutes can be posted as soon as they're available, as they were a couple of weeks ago, uh, rather than waiting until the next meeting to be able for the public to see them. <clears throat> the second comment I have is related to your function of providing public oversight of land use in Newport Beach. <clears throat> and I specifically that seemed to make appropriate a comment regarding a matter you may have heard of that's coming before the Board of Supervisors next week um, that has to do with the sale of a piece of the Upper Newport Bay Nature Preserve. Uh, that sale, it appears almost certain, is going to be blocked by an outpouring of petitions objecting to it. But the relevance to you is that when I looked at the city's general plan, <clears throat> zoning code and local coastal program maps, I noticed that the parcel in question of which a piece is proposed to be sold, although it is very clearly part of a park dedication to the county, in our zoning and planning is classified as suitable for single family housing development. And it is also shown as part of the Santa Ana Heights specific plan even though it is clearly intended to be a part of the neighboring, what we call the Upper Newport Bay Regional Park Plan Community, which is our name for that dedicated land. And there also seemed to be some question about a couple of other parcels that were adjacent to this one associated with a neighboring property. So I, th I think our planning and zoning maps and classifications for these need to be reviewed and corrected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mosher. Any other non-agenda comments? Is there anyone on the phone? Okay. Moving on to the next item. Request for continuance of staff. Are there any requests? Uh, there are none tonight, Chair. Okay, great. All right. Consent items. This is item number one, minutes of the April 28th, 2021 meeting. And again, if you want to comment on this item, it's 949 270 8165. Mr. Mosier did supply some um, amendments to those. Any commissioners want to take a stab? Anyone on the phone? Commissioner I'll, Elmore? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes with Mr. Mosier's edits. Great. And a second, please. I'll second. All right. Call for the vote.
The motion carries unanimously. Okay, thank you. Uh, public hearing items number item number two, Super Panga Restaurant PA 2020-356. The site location is 2110 and 2112 West Oceanfront. Again, if you want to comment on this item, please call 949-270-8165. Staff, please begin with your presentation. Thank you, commissioners. Good evening. My name is Jocelyn Perez with the Planning Division in the I Thank you. My name is Jocelyn Perez with the Planning Division. And the item before you is the request for a conditional use permit for a restaurant with a Type 47 ABC license and late hours. The subject property is located on West Oceanfront on the Balboa Peninsula. The project site is developed with a, a building that was built in the 1920s with commercial on the ground floor and residential above. The existing building has multiple nonconformities due in part to its age, including a limited amount of parking on site and um, an excessive floor area ratio. The project site is zoned MUW2, which allows for restaurants, and the surrounding land uses are primarily also MUW2. They are, they, are similar, um, they are a similar arrangement of commercial on the ground floor and residential above. However, there are some standalone residential within the immediate vicinity of the project site. This is a photo of the existing condition. We have Henry's Market on the left there and the uh, Il Gelato Pizza Restaurant on the right. These two suites will be merged to create the restaurant. Uh, Henry's has been selling goods in um, beer and wine since at least the 1970s per our, our city records. And the Il Gelato Pizza and Restaurant has been a restaurant use since the 1950s. The renovated restaurant will provide approximately 534 square feet of indoor dining area. This application will upgrade the existing ABC license at the restaurant from a type 41 on sale beer and wine to a type 47 on sale general. However, by merging these two commercial suites, the Henry's Market type 20 off sale license will be eliminated. So there will actually be a reduction in alcohol licenses. The proposed hours of operation for the new restaurant are relatively similar to what's already authorized. As you can see above, they will operate from 6 a.m. to 1230 Monday through Thursday and from 6 a.m. to 1 a.m. Friday through Sunday. Here's the existing floor plan in yellow. I've highlighted the net public area of the restaurant and in blue I've shown Henry's Market. The areas that are not shaded include a kitchen, back of house, uh, use, uses related to the residential above. And in the next slide, I show um, also shaded in yellow, the net public area of the Super Panga restaurant, as well as a small outdoor dining area. The unshaded areas in this slide are are also um, not included in the net public area. What we have here is the kitchen, we have the, um, the counter where the food will be assembled and there's a pickup area for patrons to collect their, uh, their, their burritos and tacos. And then there is, uh, there is seating uh, along the, the window front there as well as some, some sit down tables which will have uh, service during peak hours. In addition to the floor plan, operational characteristics are analyzed when reviewing a project. Uh, the project was routed for a review by the different uh, city departments. Uh, the police department completed its review and has no objection to the project as long as certain conditions of approval are incorporated into the resolution. Um, some other operational characteristics of this project include reducing the, the number of alcohol licenses in an over-concentrated area, 
The project will rehabilitate two older storefronts to uh, refresh and enhance this uh, very busy area of our city. The, the proposed project will provide an amenity both to residents and visitors of uh, a, a casual, a gourmet casual eating establishment that is uh, a convenient to and located adjacent to multiple mu municipal lots. And then as I mentioned earlier, this the site has non, uh, limited non-conforming parking. However, when uh, calculating the parking demand of the existing facility, 15 spaces are required. And as a result of this project, by eliminating the, the market and uh, using a, a, a parking ratio of one per 40 square feet of net public area, this project results in a demand of only 14 spaces. So this project is uh, actually not an intensification of use. Uh, with any uh, restaurant and alcohol in late hours, there are certain conditions of approval that we include in resolutions to ensure that the, that the use remains compatible with the surrounding neighborhood, as well as uh, does not become a nuisance. Some of the, the conditions we've included in the draft resolution in, um, include uh, limiting where employees can park, the hours of operation, shutting the doors and windows to prevent noise from disturbing the uh, residents above, we have conditions to ensure that the, this, this restaurant does not turn into um, a bar, such as no live entertainment, having the menu available until closing. Uh, no alcohol service is allowed on that little outdoor patio, and an operator license is required. If there are any changes to the proposed uh, operational characteristics, that's going to require a subsequent review by the, the planning division and possibly the processing of an amendment to the use permit or a new use permit. Staff is, has been able to make the findings required to recommend approval of the project. So um, they, you, they can be found in, the draft resolution can be found in the, uh, the, the memorandum sent to the planning commission. The applicant plans on presenting a, a brief PowerPoint as well, and so he, he is available for questions, as am I. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'll bring it to the commissioners for questions of staff. Commissioner Rosing. Thank you, Jocelyn, appreciate that. I, um, my first com question was basically that the plans that we received and then the subsequent plans with uh, outdoor dining, I didn't see, and maybe I missed it, uh, an elevation of the storefront, what that was going to look like? Did the applicant have something like that for us? There is an elevation that should be included in the original staff report. That would be handwritten. I'll save you that, the effort I found. <laughs> it's the last page. <laughs> Great, any other commissioner questions? I did have a question. There were some discrepancies on the time. Um, the posted agenda on the green sheet that we have says one time, it says one and 1.30, I think. And then your uh, presentation said 12.31. And then there was another part in the staff report that said 12.30 and 1.30, which I think probably was just the typo on that one. And then throughout the staff report, it says this 12.30, 1 p.m., then with a 30-minute window to kick everyone out by. And to me, just there's just a lot of confusion in that. Um, so I just, I just want to make sure which one it is that we're, we're discussing tonight. The notice was prepared to be the most conservative, the latest hours that are proposed. Uh, Monday through Thursday should be until 12.30 with uh, 30 minutes for all patrons to vacate the facility and uh, the weekend should be until 1 a.m. with that same 30 minute period to vacate the facility. So say I show up at 12.29 and order my food, I have till 1 p.m. to finish that and get out? That's kind of what the thought is behind that? Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, um, I'll ask uh, commissioners, any other questions? Commissioner Kenny. 
Yes, Chair, I'd like to ask, have the uh, applicant make a little presentation about those hours in the kitchen because I think we can clear this whole thing up. Thank sure, uh, he'll do, uh, present that. I'll just ask us first for a round of ex parte communications and I'll have him come up. Since my meter's on, I'll say I had a phone call and discussed it with one of the proprietors. Great, Commissioner Rosine, you wanna start us? None. I met with the applicant and their consultants. I had a phone conversation with the applicant's consultant. Phone conversation with the applicant. Uh, um, app, um, meetings with applicant and uh, phone conversation with the consultant. Yes, and I too had phone conversations. We discussed the merits of the project, asked if I had any concerns, and they gave a, a historical perspective of the, uh, of the project or of the property. Okay, I will uh, ask for and open the public hearing and I'll uh, have the applicant come on up and give a presentation. While they're coming up, I'll remind anyone on the uh, watching on TV, again, you can call 949-270-8165 if you have any uh, questions or, or, or comments, I mean. <clears throat> Good evening, Chair Wigan, members of the Newport Beach Planning Commission. My name is Mario Morovic. We're here tonight to discuss the P Super Ponga Taqueria. Uh, we want to expand an existing restaurant in Newport Beach into the adjacent liquor store. A little background on myself. I grew up in Orange County, lived in Newport Beach for approximately 25 years, married to my wife, Ashley, two young daughters, Grace and Kate. I did my undergraduate at the University of Southern California Entrepreneurship. I actually wrote my senior business plan on opening up a restaurant tavern. A couple years later, I went to work um, after my MBA. I went to work in Silicon Valley. And that old saying rang true, you don't know what you have until it's gone. I um, ended up missing the restaurant and hospitality industry that I grew up in once I went to pursue a career in finance. I quit my job, moved back to Orange County and pursued my dream of opening up restaurants and taverns in Orange County. I currently own uh, 12 locations with my partner, Andrew Gabriel. We employ about 600 people throughout Orange County at our 12 locations. Uh, we founded the um, Bar and Tavern Association in Newport Beach in conjunction with the Newport Beach Police Department. We've invested a lot of money in the Newport Pier, McFadden area, and made a positive impact on the community, not just for this generation, but for the next generation as well. We work side by side with the police department, city council, planning department, and we have quarterly meetings with residents and business owners to discuss the state of the peninsula. The security plan that's required for the restaurant operator's license, I actually authored the template for, for that a few years back when I offered a security plan for one of my businesses. The police department liked it so much that they use the one that I authored as the template for future operators looking for late night hours. <clears throat> My partner, Andrew Gabriel, and I have a business philosophy. We want to reinvest in the community. We want to make business and financial decisions that leave things better for the next generation than Andrew and I found them. We oftentimes talk about how things are going to be for, for our kids when they get older and, and, and our grandkids. So we try and make investments and business decisions now that will have a positive impact on the community for years to come. Just last weekend, we hosted our seventh annual Newport Beach cleanup. We've been doing this for seven years, twice a year. We do it in the spring and in the fall, beginning and end of summer. We have hundreds of volunteers that show up. We distribute bags, gloves, hot coffee, cocoa, and we pick up hundreds and hundreds of pounds of trash and debris off of our beaches. We've been doing free yoga on the beach in front of Super Ponga and Dory Deli for years. But this past year with COVID, the community was so thankful that they had a safe outdoor area to conduct yoga. It really brought the community closer together. March 17th, 2020, probably the hardest day of my life. That was the day every restaurant and tavern in the state of California was required to close. At a time that we were hit the hardest, between March 17th and March 20th, we were able to procure 10,000 rolls of toilet paper donated 2,500 to assisted and senior living homes and distributed the other 7,500 to members of the community. Remember the days when grocery store shelves were empty and you couldn't find toilet paper? It's hard to believe how much has passed in the last 18 months. Why are we here today? I think it's quite simple. We have an existing restaurant that closed during COVID. We own the property. When that restaurant vacated, Andrew and I decided to rebrand it Super Ponga Taqueria. 
Gourmet Casual, Rotisserie El Pastor, Scratch Kitchen, Counter Service. Next door, we have a liquor store tenant who pays us very good rent. It'll be extremely easy for us to keep that um, tenant there and get mailbox money every month and have Super Ponga be slightly smaller. But we decided to proceed with kicking out the liquor store that has late night hours, multiple ABC violations, and also off-site liquor sales are a problem on the peninsula. So we would like to take our gourmet casual Mexican concept and expand it into the adjacent unit and eliminate that liquor license and use in its entirety. Dory Deli is proof of concept. Super Ponga Taqueria is a similar use, substantially less occupancy. Dory Deli has 98 occupants. Super Ponga is going to have 41, almost 60% less occupants. Dory is in great standing with the community. No concern with neighboring properties. In front of us is the parking lot and the Pacific Ocean. I'd like to recommend the Planning Commission supports staff recommendation with a slight clarification and modification to conditions 12, 25, and 37. The closing hour language currently states one o'clock on weekdays, I'm sorry, 12.30 on weekdays, one o'clock on weekends, plus 30 minutes after the 12.30 and one. The staff summary tonight stated one o'clock on weekdays, 1.30 on weekends. I'd like to recommend that the hours of operation are more concise with the one o'clock and 1.30. I'd like to recommend that the kitchen service to the public stops one hour prior to closing. I believe the condition currently reads that full food service will be required up until the time of closing. The kitchen needs time to make it. The customers need time to eat it. I can't take last minute, well, operationally, we can't take last minute food orders and then ask people to leave the building. So we're just asking that we stop, we keep the kitchen open, we stop taking orders one hour prior, but that doesn't mean the kitchen's gonna close. The kitchen still needs to facilitate whatever orders are still in queue. And the closing of the windows, when you saw the floor plan, a yeah, big part of our layout was that um, long counter seat facing out. There's gonna be a glass panel garage door that's gonna close on the countertop. If somebody's sitting there eating at 11 o'clock and we close the windows, they're literally gonna be eating about four inches away from a glass panel in front of their face. We, we don't mind closing the windows before the restaurant's closed, but we like to have that be in line with the kitchen closing. The kitchen closes one hour prior, the windows close one hour prior, and then the restaurant closes at 1 and 1.30 concisely. And that was um, the presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ketting, you had a question? No, my question was that I wanted him to explain it, and he did a very good job. Perfect. No problem. Uh, any other questions from? Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner Rosine, I'll go with you. You went first. Hey, just real quickly. and. Uh, Going back to the Dory Deli, how it has that open concept, and then what, we're do, what you're proposing here. And thank you, I found the elevation. But I'm just tr you just mentioned it would be a glass panel and then a garage door that would go down on top in front of it. Is that what I understood? Or is it open and then the, a garage panel would go down? It would be a 42-inch um, high countertop with a pony wall in front of it. And it would be about an 18-inch deep counter and the glass panel would close right on top of it. Uh, I'm sorry, it would be a glass paneled garage door. So it'd be a garage door that's on a track with, with glass panels in it. So if you, if you closed it and you're eating there, you're, you're taking up about half the counter space when you close it and you, it just wouldn't really be the most enjoyable dining experience. Similar to Dory Deli, except it's gonna be facing out instead of on the side. Yeah, similar to Dory Deli, um, a different style of door, but a um, the similar style concept, door. yes. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Klossermeyer. Yes, there was a last minute an amendment that came through for an outdoor patio. It, it looks like the dimensions of that are three feet by eight feet, eight inches. And I don't see any seating out there. I'm just wondering what the intent of that patio is. So that patio was entitled, I believe, um, 2007. So about 14 years ago, it was already part of the previous CEP, and I believe it's 36 inches by 104, and it'll just be putting two tables there with four chairs each. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Kenning. A couple little things. The way that the buildings are now, is it on one parcel or two? 
Um, so this particular property is one parcel. All right, that's and that, But it's, it's, it's unique though, because if you look at the facade from the street, it looks like it's a bigger building than it really is. Those are all separate parcels after this parcel. But the neighboring properties, all the facades are connected. All right, and last question. Explain to everybody when I asked you about this, uh, construction staging and bring you know, materials in and out while you're remodeling. Where are you gonna do it? Um, not much staging needed because this is a minimal interior construction and demo. Um, there's a carport behind Super Ponga. It's a two car wide um, open air carport. And behind that, we have another um, parking lot that's in, um, in the back of Super Ponga that has about, um, uh, I think five or 6,000 feet of concrete. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Any other commissioner questions? I just had a quick one on that item number 25 related to the noise or related to the closing of the doors and the windows. As far as I think the reason for it was for noise prevention at, at late hours. Who are the tenants that live above? Like, are they, um, you own the building, right? Um, or are they, are they your tenants? Or is there a kind of a clause that is built in there that you, know, you live in a high noise area, there's already six bars, Blue Beat and Beach Ball are up until two, right? Like there's already kind of a noise down there, correct? Yeah, there's lots of unique noise issues on the peninsula. Sometimes it's early morning dumpsters or you know, whatnot, but um, we own um, the units upstairs. We own all the residential units on the entire block except for one. The only one that we don't own is um, closer to Taco Bell. Um, every tenant signs a disclosure as part of their lease. Um, they acknowledge that they're living in a, in a high concentration commercial area and we don't have any issues with, with it. We discuss this with the tenants upon moving in. Uh, we've got long-term tenancy. We don't have um, any tenants that complain about it because they, they know where they live and they actually enjoy it. Great. All right, I will uh, bring it uh, to, unless there's any other questions. Okay. I'll bring it to the uh, public. Uh, is there anyone in the... Uh, Chambers here that would wish to comment on this item. Uh, Chair Wigan, members of the uh, commission, uh, this is Jim Mosher again. I had uh, two comments. First, we heard early in the staff report that the expanded restaurant facility would provide a desirable amenity for visitors and the community. I hope you will consider this as a mixed use district and the use being eliminated, which we've been told is a liquor store, actually on the sign says that it's a market. And I believe on the internet, they claim that they're a grocery store. So I'm hoping you would consider whether you are also losing an amenity that might be rarer in that area than restaurants. There seem like a lot of restaurants, not too many markets there. And then second, regarding the last minute addendum about the outdoor dining. Uh, first of all, the city council, I think, is in the midst of being about to consider what they want to be the policy about outdoor dining on sidewalks. And I don't know whether this will be in alignment with that or not. Uh, but I have the perennial question that I think has been asked here before, perhaps by Commissioner Ketting, and we've never quite got the answer to. Uh, does the city charge rent for the use of the public sidewalk? And if so, how much are we charging for this sidewalk? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mosier. Any other comments in the chamber? Is there anyone on the phone? Okay. I'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the commission for discussion. Commissioner Ketting. Yes, I think that um, the Proposal is um, an improvement to the area. I think the operator, we're lucky to have them. They've done an excellent job, and this is expanding into that, and they're only going to protect everything they've redeveloped and developed in the area, as well as provide a new restaurant concept. Um, I can support the findings, and I can make a motion for approval, unless we want to talk about it some more. And I agree with their options on the, the 1 a.m. and the 1.30 modifications on conditions 12, um, 25 on, on the noise, and there was another one in the middle there. What number was that? The, um, the operations after kitchen closes or? 
Yeah, 27. I think their, their requested modifications would be acceptable to me. <clears throat> okay. And then has he phrased that correctly as far as the motion? If, you, if, if that's a motion, is that staff? And this is for a CUP and operator license. I think for the record, we could go ahead and, and just we'll, we'll enter it in the record and we'll call it out specifically. But I think we've just finished up with, with the um, commissioner's comments. Sure. <clears throat> Commissioner Rosing. If the outdoor dining space didn't align with council's concept of using that outdoor space, what would happen to that part of the approval? That's for staff. Commissioner Rosine, the, the existing uh, patio that's there right now, it was authorized in 2007 through an outdoor dining permit and an encroachment permit based upon the existing standards of our municipal code. Um, and so we're just looking to uh, you know, reauthorize the existing authorized space with this permit. So it would be consistent with, with our current standards. You know, if the council expands that in the future, then the applicant might have the ability to expand it consistent with the future standards. So it, it's, it wouldn't be inconsistent today. Commissioner and, Clint. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Rosie. Um, I, I realize this is probably a stretch, but I don't know if that up. What would happen if the council decided that they didn't want uh, dining in this particular area like that? I realize it's probably unlikely, but ask the question. And that, that, that's a good question, Commissioner Rosine. Um, you know, I, the council would probably need to change the municipal code to, uh, right now there is a provision in the municipal code that allows for cafes in the public right of way uh, today. And so they would actually have to change that to take those provisions and modify them and restrict them further. I'm not sure the council's going in that direction. Appreciate that. Commissioner Kleiman. Uh, presuming that uh, Commissioner Ketting actually made a motion, I'm prepared to second that. Is that? It sounded like he did, but maybe I, I jumped the gun on that. So if commissioners want to continue to, to opine, I'm, I'm open to that too. Commissioner Elmore. I, was that, was yours a motion? I, I, it, yeah, I jumped the gun and made a motion for approval, adding those <laughs> modifications. I was fishing for a second. So I am prepared to make that second. I think um, the loss of, uh, or reduction, I should say, in um, alcohol licenses in that area, particularly the type of license, as we discussed, um, the off-sale is, is definitely a win uh, for the city and for our police resources. Um, so I, I will go ahead and make that second. Commissioner Elmore, did you? Okay. And, and then um, do I need to ask the applicant for his... That, that, that. Certainly, and I just want to be clear with the commission. This is, we are um, introducing the amended resolution that was sent to you yesterday that's on your dais with the red lines for the outdoor patio. And we're amending that with regards to conditioned, I guess you'll have to, we'll go through the conditions. Conditions 12 will be amended and to 1 a.m. on the weekdays and 1.30 on the weekends for the closing time. What was the other ones? 25. Correct. I'm, would, I'm looking at two different ones here, sorry. 25 if, with if time with the chair, kitchen's closing. I show removal of um, condition number 25 as well as with respect to 37, um, making that closure of the kitchen one hour prior to closing. Correct, and do we have that correct with the applicant? Okay. And you're okay with that? I take it. <laughs> All right. Well, we good to uh, call think for we're the good. vote? Okay. Yep. Let's call for the vote. Oh, hold on one sec before we call for it. I think there's still uh, our attorneys just Yeah, I just want to make sure notes. I understand. Um, I, I, I believe <clears throat> Mr. Mark Mariovic indicated that he wanted conditions 25 and 37 which may be renumbered in the revised resolution, but from the one in the staff report uh, to, to close the windows and doors one hour before closing, and then the kitchen mm -hmm. service would be uh, closing down one hour before closing. Yeah, I think 25 might be timing with the kitchen closing, I think would be the language you could put yeah. in there. Thank you. And then that makes it easier then. Okay, so they would be consistent that they would be one hour before closing. Because if you 25 would say time with kitchen closing and then 37 would be, I think, they wanted one hour prior to closing, so that one was more specific. That 
make sense. Sure. Yes, it does make sense. Sorry, Sorry real quick. Condition 25 was to have it at closing was my interpretation. Kitchen, kitchen closing. But if, you know, if the applicant, I'll reopen the public hearing then, I think, right, to have the applicant come back up or can he come out without reopening? I would reopen the public hearing. Just yeah. for limited purpose, yeah. Yeah, let's have the applicant come up to make sure that we have it on the same page so that. So the um, clarification was to um, stop taking food orders one hour prior to closing and to close the windows at the same time we stop taking food orders or close the kitchen, whichever came sooner. Makes sense. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. I will reclose the public. Here, before we, oh. before we take um, our vote, I'd like to hear from Amaro's partner, Mr. Gabriel, that all the conditions are acceptable. You got to get your steps in. Good evening. Thank you. Um, yes, um, I accept Take all. your of, name. My name is Andrew Gabriel. Very good. Now you're on the record, so you agree to all these condition changes. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will reclose the public hearing and um, call for the vote. And everyone's the second and the maker of the motion is still acceptable to those? Yes. Uh, Mr. Ketting? Yeah. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's up for us to vote. Thank you, Curtis. The motion carries unanimously. Okay. Do a good job down there. All right. I'll move on to the next item. This is a study session, item number three. This is the residence at Newport Center. PA 2020-020, and the site location is 150 Newport Center Drive. And staff, um, just give uh, a few moments to clear out the room, and then uh, I'll let people know uh, that's watching on TV. You can call in 949-270-8165. Commissioner Ketting, they're getting off to a good start with the materials board. You're usually pretty much always want to know stickler on that. So they've got one and uh, we'll definitely make this meeting start well for you. Um, just off to the side, actually with that screen's not being used really anymore. So wherever you feel, especially in a line of sight for uh, Commissioner Ketting, that I think is the most important. Perfect. Liz, you think you're, you're ready to go with it or should we wait? Yeah, we can go if you're ready. I don't think it's that much of a distraction. Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening, Chair Wigan, Planning Commissioners. I'm Liz Westmoreland with the Planning Division. The application we'll be discussing tonight is the Residences at Newport Center project. First, I'd like to provide a brief overview of what we'll be discussing tonight. It's important for me to emphasize that this is a study session. 
No decisions will be made tonight. This is solely an informational meeting for the public and the planning commissioner's benefit to be able to learn more about the project before taking action in the future. First, I'll provide a brief presentation regarding the planning components of the project, and then the applicant will be providing the bulk of the presentation tonight, discussing the design, the materials, and other features. And then we will have plenty of time for comments and questions. First, the project site is located at 150 Newport Center Drive. It's located south of Fashion Island and north of Coast Highway. It's within the Gateway Plaza area and across the street from Muldoon's. Under existing conditions, there is an existing Newport Beach car wash located on the site that was built in 1970. There have not been many changes to the site since that time other than to provide some updates to the underground storage tanks that are located there to serve the gasoline pumps. There's also a small convenience store. Here's a view of the existing site from Newport Center Drive. There is also an existing trench drain that currently collects the wastewater on site and clarifies it before putting it into the storm drain or sewer system. You may recognize the project site from a prior project that was submitted in 2014. This application was later withdrawn in 2016 prior to council action on the project. That project no longer exists. It included 49 condominiums and was almost 80 feet high. The proposed project we're discussing today includes 28 condominium units. They're designed in the flat style residential living, which means that each one is one floor. There's two levels of subterranean parking proposed, and the building would be four stories high and approximately 53 feet high. There's common and private open space areas, and the residential units range from about 1,400 square feet to up to 5,600 square feet per flat for the penthouse units at the top. The project requires several entitlements to be constructed. First is a general plan amendment to change the general plan designation from a commercial land use to a residential land use. And with this comes changes to the general plan anomaly table, which establishes the development limits on the site and would need to be updated to allow for residential units. Next is the associated zoning code amendment to change from the office regional designation to the planned community designation. The applicant is proposing a planned community development plan, which essentially allows them to establish the development standards for the site. This means height, setbacks, floor area, parking requirements, etc. Entitlements also include a site development review to allow the construction of 28 dwelling units, a tract map to allow each of those units to be sold individually, and a voluntary development agreement that has been proposed by the applicant to provide them with certain assurances as well as the city with public benefit fees. Lastly, an environmental impact report to comply with CEQA. First, to orient you to the project site, we have Newport Center Drive on the left-hand side of your screen and Anna Kappa Drive at the top. There is an existing access drive off-site that you see with the yellow arrow that would be maintained as part of the project and provide the main access to the driveway that leads to the subterranean parking level for the residents. This is located off-site on Irvine Company property. I will briefly go through the site plan, but please keep in mind that the applicant will be discussing the, the project design in detail, so this is very brief. We're looking at the first level of the proposal. On the first level is where all the common areas and amenities are located, such as the pool, courtyard, fitness area, concierge, et cetera, as well as eight residential flats. There are 15-foot setbacks required along Anna Kappa Drive and Newport Center Drive, although the project provides more setbacks than required by the code. The applicant is proposing a guest and a valet entrance along Anna Kappa Drive, and the main entrance for residences will be located via that driveway we discussed earlier where that little arrow is on the right hand corner. Additionally, I do want to note that the site plans and the designs that you'll see tonight, uh, the landscaping plans, pardon, will look a little bit different than what you have in your packet as there were a couple updates after publishing the report to make the landscaping plans consistent with the architectural, namely the residential patio for flat eight in the upper corner. Here's a rendering that gives you an idea of the design of the project site. Again, the applicant will be going into this in detail. They've provided a materials board for you here that they'll go through, um, as well as a landscaping palette. Because this project includes a general plan amendment, it is important that we do an analysis 
pursuant to green light or charter section 423. Charter section 423 requires that for all general plan amendments, we evaluate them to see if they would constitute a major amendment of the general plan, which would trigger an electorate, a vote of the electorate. In this case, in all cases with general plan amendments, we have to look at both the development proposed by the project as well as the cumulative development within the statistical area to understand if it might trigger the, the four various thresholds um, under the charter section. So in this case, there's no commercial square footage, so it would not meet that threshold. It would not exceed the allowance for dwelling units. It would not in increase the AM peak hour trips beyond um, the threshold, and same goes for the PM peak hour trips. Last but very important is the CEQA review. The current draft EIR is out for public review until June 14th. We are asking that the public and others provide comments in writing prior to June 14th on the adequacy of the EIR. Again, that date is June 14th. There were no significant or unavoidable impacts identified in the EIR, and there's four topical sections in the document that require mitigation that are listed here on your screen. We've also evaluated four alternatives pursuant to CEQA. In terms of next steps, first we'll complete the EIR review period, draft responses to comments, prepare the final EIR, and ultimately go to planning commission for a public hearing and a decision in August of this year. Then we anticipate a city council hearing based on the legislative acts that are included with the project in September of 2021. Now I'd like to hand it over to the applicant team. We have Coralie Newman who will be starting the presentation for the applicants and then I will be available as well as them for any questions you have. Thanks Liz. Good evening, Chairman Wigan and members of the Newport Beach Planning Commission. I want to say as a resident and a business owner here in Newport Beach, it is definitely a pleasure to be back in these chambers and being able to be in person here and um, seeing your all faces and uh, it feels really good. <laughs> I, like our previous applicant, am proud to say that I am a 35-year resident of Newport Beach. I've lived and worked my entire career here, raised my family here, and um, continue to have my offices at 1601 Dove Street in Newport Beach, and I'm a president of Government Solutions, Inc. I am giving um, the introduction to our presentation, but both our architect and landscape architect will also be presenting, and as Commissioner Ketting can see, we can get into details of the uh, board there. Um, oh, okay. Uh, with me this evening is our team, uh, our senior associate from Government Solutions, Katie Newman, who did um, put this PowerPoint together along with our team. We have our applicant, Newport Center Anacapa Associates, represented by Todd Ridgway and Scott Ridgway. Our architect from Stearns Architecture, Glenn Butler, is with us this evening. Our landscape architect from MJ Landscape Architecture, Mark Schattinger, is here this evening with us. And our engineer from Fusco Engineering, Mark Nero, is also here for questions. So I think we have a complete team to answer any of the technical questions that you may uh, have this evening. As Liz has mentioned, um, I won't spend any time on this, but we are asking for a general plan amendment zone code amendment, plan community development plan, major site development review, tentative track map, and a development agreement that will be coming forward to you in the next months. We have completed, I'm proud to say, um, especially again as being a member of this community, we have done some research of some outreach already. Uh, not saying that we're done yet, but we have started. And we have met with Spawn via a Zoom meeting on April 13th. We met with Harborview Hills Community Association. As you know, the president of that is a very active member of our community, Deborah Allen. Um, they were very pleased with our presentation. We, our site is not in their view easement. As you know, they're very concerned about uh, that. And we, we do not come into that easement. And we have upcoming on May 19th, the Irvine Terrace Community Association. That is scheduled. 
we are um, continuing to work to meet with the Broadmoor associations that abut the Harborview Community Association so that we can say that we've touched base with all of our neighbors that over residential neighbors that overlook our site. So far, those meetings have been very positive. And I think in part, as Liz have said, we have been, this site has been here before you, and it was a taller seven-story building, as Liz said, almost 80 feet in height with 49 units. And I think that the owner has been responsive uh, with this new project to the community issues at that time, and there has been a very uh, positive receptivity to the proposed project before you this evening. As Liz, is, as Liz has mentioned, um, the residence of Newport Center is located in Newport Center in Block 100. Um, I actually started my first office in Block 100 in Gateway Plaza. It, it should be known that the middle of this block, which is officially known as Gateway Plaza, is owned by the Irvine Company, and it is, a, it is zoned already PC56, which allows a 50-foot in height with an additional 10-foot overlay. So that already exists in this block. The other corners of uh, Gateway Plaza, like ourselves, are owned by others. So we represent the corner of the residents of Newport Center at Anacapa Drive in Newport Center. The corner office building that's at Civic Center Drive is 180 Newport Center Drive. You come around the bend, there's a very small uh, office building at 190. Civic Center Drive, and then at the very top of the uh, Block 100 is, excuse me, those are all Newport Center Drive addresses, is 100 Newport Center Drive, and many of you may have been in that building and are familiar with it because that was John Hamilton's sports museum um, location for many years, and I think many of us went to events in that, in that office building. Also, uh, directly across the street from us is the Red O and the Fig and Olive restaurants, which are popular uh, restaurants in Newport Center. And then, of course, everyone's favorite, Muldoon's Irish Pub. It's located at 202 Newport Center Drive, right across the street from us on Anacapa. And um, Spa Gregory is another popular uh, spot in Newport Center is across the street there. Our project stats, um, Liz covered this pretty thoroughly, but again, we're a 1.26 acre size uh, site. We're, pr we're proposing, and this is a study session, of course, and we're here to hear your comments, but our proposal is a four-story residential building with 28 luxury condominiums, two levels of underground parking with a total of 83 total parking spaces and approximately 15,000 square feet of open space. We're calling this building architectural style California Coastal Contemporary. The site plan, which we'll go, the, our architect will go into more detail on, um, does have, um, is shown here, as Liz was trying to describe, and it's hard to describe the different uh, access points, but guests will go in as that uh, arrow just showed. So they will enter and go into the underground um, garage in that location. And residents will enter off of Anacapa, come around on the private existing driveway and go into the underground garage in that location. The ground floor of the building um, does have a lobby and lounge and it's fully appointed kitchen and fitness room along with a laptop, uh, lab pool and spa. Again, the main entrance will have outside concierge service managed 24-7 that will interface with service personnel from Postal, UPS, FedEx, Amazon, including food delivery services. These graphics are a little hard to read, and the architect can go through these in deep, more detail, but generally, again, the main entrance for the residents is off Anacapa, and you see that little red stop sign, that is where they will stop with their technology to go through the security gates. Um, each resident will have an individual two-car garage. Um, in, in this garage, there are eight garages on the first level, the parking level one, 
And on the second level, which we'll come to in a minute, there are 20 garages. Down the center of the garage is the visitor parking. The garage is completely secure. One other point, uh, this came up in some of the comments to the EIR, to the, the notice of prep, is deliveries and trash. And you'll see there's a large area to closest to Anacapa on this level, on the first level of the garage, which can be used for uh, guest parking, for events, uh, can be used, its purpose, primary purpose is for delivery area, but it's a very large open space area that we have not designated for any other uses but parking and servicing. Emergency service vehicles will use Anacapa right away and not, will not be on site. That's per their request and their requirements. And the second level of the garage, again, has 20 uh, individual residential garages. I think one thing that the Meridian found that this type of resident that is gonna move into this building wants to have their own garage. One of the lessons learned from the Meridian is that the clientele is probably gonna be, for the most part, Newport Beach uh, homeowners that want to have a full service. They're ready to get rid of their yards and, and uh, move out of a single family resident into a full service building. That's what the Meridian has experienced. Almost 100% of their sales were Newport, to Newport Beach residents in the first go around. <laughs> um, and then with that, I will turn the architectural section of this presentation over to um, our architect, Glenn Butler. Thank you very much for your attention. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. Uh, my name is Glenn Butler. I work with Stearns Architecture. Um, This is an illustration of the proposed project from the Anacapa frontage. Here you can see the four levels above grade and the basic concept of two separate wings, residential wings connected by a ground floor lobby with amenities. As uh, Coralie mentioned, we would call the style of the building uh, California Coastal Contemporary. Uh, the building celebrates the California lifestyle with an emphasis on indoor-outdoor living. All the units have generous balconies and large windows. Uh, the exterior of the building is clad in stone to create a, a durable, sophisticated exterior. Uh, specifically, we have selected a light-colored limestone or travertine uh, for the main body of the building with a darker access, accent stone. Uh, we're trying to create a, a dynamic building with a strong horizontal emphasis. Let's see. This is a, a corner and um, as though you were leaving uh, the, big, uh, the fig and olive walking away from uh, Fashion Island and on the left is the is the main entry, Anacapa, and off to the right is Newport Center Drive. Again, you can see the four, the four levels above grade here, lots of glass, generous balconies. Here's our basic palette. Um, we can go through that in more detail. Uh, but the primary stone being the vast, uh, the vast majority of the building and then a, a darker accent stone. And we're showing two stones uh, for each because what we're doing is we have horizontal bands. You will not be able to see that from a distance, but it adds a layer of interest and uh, texture. It's even tactile when you get up close to it um, as you get closer. Here's our section, I might not be that leg legible at this scale, but the basic building is 53 feet from the, the planning 
datum, which they use. Uh, you can see, to some extent, the left side of the page is substantially higher than the right. There's a, there's a good slope across the building um, in the neighborhood of 10 feet. I'd have to double check. Here's the basic site plan again, and you can see um, the pattern. Uh, the two wings are the light yellow. We have four units on each wing. Uh, the brighter yellow is the amenities that connect it. Uh, as you come in, there's a lobby with a concierge. There's an office where they receive uh, mail and packages. Um, there's a meeting room with a kitchen uh, for uh, activities of the residents. Fitness center, which has uh, glass facing onto the pool. There's a pool, uh, a spa, and an outdoor uh, seating associated with those. And there's a fairly generous lounge. Again, they're trying to create a full service um, building. So um, just by that nature, by its nature, you won't have as many car trips as many of the amenities people go out to outside for will be there. And I'll quickly go up the, the different levels of the building. This is the second level. Again, four units in each wing. Uh, all the elevators are accessible by all the residents. There aren't any private elevators, per se, for a particular unit. So each wing has two elevators um, for, the, for the residents, and there's one large service elevator for deliveries and move-ins. Same pattern on the third floor. And fourth floor is just a little different. The penthouse units are two in each wing, and those being the largest units with the best views. And we'll let uh, landscape architect uh, tell you about the landscape. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Mark Schattinger, Principal with MJS Design Group. And I will take you through landscape right now. So this is the illustrative landscape plan or conceptual landscape plan. Uh, like Glenn mentioned, we are looking at a California coastal plant palette. It's going to be leafy. It's going to be colorful. We're going to treat the Newport Center Drive landscape setback, which was said earlier was very generous, as just as important as the, as the front door on Ina Kappa. The design approach was uh, uh, to be a small boutique, curated, high quality feeling like a hotel would be. So we're using stone pavers at the motor court drop off. The, the, with the fountain that greets uh, visitors. There's three gracious steps up to the lobby. There's a sloped walkway for ADA reasons. And then the uh, lobby is gonna be pretty transparent as we'll see through the uh, subsequent slides. And it takes you into this rear courtyard which has the uh, pool seating area with soft seating and the spa. There's been some discussion about the side that faces the uh, Gateway Plaza parking lot. We are proposing 48 inch box uh, evergreen vertical trees there. You will not see any of the uh, podium out of the ground. And then uh, beyond the pool, we are introducing four date palms there. So we expect to see a, a very evergreen green screen along that entire property line adjacent to the parking lot. Here's a perspective as if you were being dropped off at the front door. We are looking at doing a zero inch curb face. So it's a, even transition from the drive aisle to the walkway. We're using pottery for protection. And then you see the three steps up, the fountain and the green wall on the uh, far left side. Here's the rear yard. You know, we wanna keep everything intimate and small so it's not a courtyard, it's more, it's more really felt like a private yard. And we have a, a nice spa. We are proposing wood around the spa. We have a, a lap pool which is about 45 by 16. And then we have some really nice furniture and pottery. All this is over uh, the parking structure. So everything, all the plant material has to be in a raised planter or a pottery. And then here's a, from the water level view here, big long steps. So, you know, pools are pools, you know, they use them mostly for marketing reasons, 
but um, we find that people really enjoy sitting on the steps to stay cool and do less lap swimming than just sitting on the steps. So we have very long, generous steps in this pool. And then here's some of the soft seating. Not everyone wants to be in a bathing suit next to the pool. So you can still feel comfortable in this little alcove just outside the rear doors of the uh, lobby area. So I don't know who's going to take over the view settings. Thank you, Courtly. Thank you. Thank you. This will be the final part of our presentation. As we all know, views um, have been very important over this property historically. So in the environmental impact report that is out for distribution, there is a series of view sims. And we felt that they should be highlighted. A few of them should be highlighted for the commission's uh, purview. Uh, we did create this one graphic only to show, and, I, and we have a blow up of this so you can read the actually read the numbers but our building has has been noted is 53 feet in height with a total elevation of 221 feet so when you go around Newport Center in our general areas in blocks one two and three we are really commensurate with the heights that are around us and because of that as you'll see as we move into the view sims our building really is tucked um, nestled into the existing uh, buildings and uh, landscaping that exists. This is just a little bit of a clear picture. So if you start at the corner of Newport Center and Newport Center, um, it's a lower elevation beginning. And it's a, the one story, two story building. It's 30 feet and total elevation, total height of 188. Our building is a 53 foot building with a total height from grade of 221 feet as you go up Newport Center across the street of Anacapa you see now we're moving into uh, heights total heights of 213 feet 252 feet and down in the corner there is actually a six-story building that goes to 70 feet with a total of 267 feet so we are very much in keeping with our surroundings which the view sims really um, prove out um, to demonstrate that fact This is the neighborhood I talked about that um, the Deborah Allen, a very um, long-term resident and verbal uh, resident about views lives in, and we showed this to their homeowner association, but you can see this is the existing views from Crown Drive and Ebb Tide Drive, Ebb Tide Road, excuse me, and then the building is, is not really visible from this location. This is the walkway. If you've been in this community, there is a walkway from their community down to MacArthur. So in this location at C Lane, at the corner of C Lane and Crown Drive, again, the building is nestled into the existing landscaping and tucked behind buildings in the foreground that uh, are, are higher. Moving a, a little bit over to the north, we're in the Harbor View Broadmoor community, Windover Drive and Surfline Way, existing conditions and proposed conditions. Again, in Broadmoor Hills community, Salt Air Drive and Blue Water Drive, existing conditions. And we, our engineer actually blew, drew the building in so you would actually understand where it is. This is um, our wonderful Civic Center Park Bridge at Avocado Avenue and San Miguel, which uh, Google Maps has named Bunny Henge. Um, we can, we're looking out across Newport Center back towards our project. And here again, the uh, engineer has yellowed in the, what, where the building is actually located, but very little of it will be seen or distract from this view, from this park, excuse me. And this is the Macy's Park, which many of you know was dedicated to a senior architect at the Irvine Company, Roger Seitz. Um, they actually had this park uh, improved. And so this is the view from this park. Uh, well, it's really actually from the escalators looking out over the Macy's parking lot towards where our building will be. And now you actually do see the building 
as you should in this location. Finally, the last two are really, I would not really call these view sims, I guess more of a, of a real life simulation of before and after. So this is the existing site looking um, from the Red O restaurant across to the uh, existing car wash. And then as proposed, there is our building, which I believe really fits into Newport Center. And finally, uh, looking down from Newport Center Drive, kind of behind Vic and Olive Restaurant, uh, we're looking over towards, um, tucked in there is Muldoon's. And then there is um, our building. And this, this picture is very um, demonstrative of how we fit into this block and into this location and into Newport Center. The, when you do review the EIR and as the community, well, there are more view sims, but we selected these with staff because we thought these were the ones that most the community was most interested in. In conclusion for our tonight's study session, and again, this is an informal meeting. We're not asking for a decision. Um, we're only here to inform and to hear issues and any questions that you have that we don't have answers for tonight, it, it will be uh, our responsibility to work with staff to come back with the answers to questions that we may not know, answers that we may not, not have the information for, but I do think we probably have a lot of expertise here that you could avail yourself to. So our, we believe that community concerns have been addressed in lowering the height from the prior project. We've reduced the number of units and we have no view impacts that we have been able to understand um, from the existing residential communities. Uh, finally, we do have also have project benefits. We've reduced the traffic by 75%. When you read your EIR, uh, which I think comes to you as a final version, um, it is an incredible number in terms of the reduction of trips which are, which are noted in the traffic report. Um, we lower water usage with less impact on wastewater, architectural consistency and enhance, enhancement to Newport Center. And we do will be bringing forward with you when, I, when we come back to hearing with the final numbers, but there have there is work on a community benefit fee through the development agreement that will come forward to you that's negotiated by the city council and staff members and the applicant, obviously. So that is our presentation for you this evening. We thank you very much for your attention and we look forward to your questions. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, again, there will be no vote taken, but commissioners will get an opportunity to discuss. So I will go um, just before I do, uh, is, there's no ex parte since we're not voting, correct? That's correct. All right, perfect. Well, I will, can skip that step and um, ask any commissioners for questions of staff and the applicant. Commissioner Kleiman. Uh, just a couple of points of clarification. Uh, the first one being, Corey, you just went over some uh, some reductions, as you called them. I assume you mean in comparison to the previously proposed project. Yes. Okay. As staff has mentioned, that we are considering this a new application with a new environmental impact report. But I think, in terms of the community outreach the difference between what was previously posed in 2014, 2014 to what's coming forward tonight is so dramatic that the, we've gotten a very positive, like, you're, we, this is much better. <laughs> yeah, it's a good looking project. Um, and then for staff, I just wanna clarify, I think I know the answer, but um, I guess for the benefit of the public, um, this project, because it is a new application, would go towards our, our arena numbers, correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lowry. Sure. Just uh, kind of project scheduling timeline, like say from grading to say CFO, how long do you expect just for the construction? Is there an idea there? Probably a couple of years, but okay. I could get clarification on that. Okay. We're hoping to be through the entitlement process, as Liz has said, and by the end of summer, early fall, okay. and then I think they're gonna be ready to move forward and the current as quickly. Current car wash, they like month to month, so they're... Yes, uh, okay. yeah, they're aware that this closure is coming. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Rosine. I just wanted to follow up on a question about the traffic. So I, I heard old project, 
and it's less traffic than that project. Is that no. what I heard, or is it is no. it less traffic than the current condition? Thank you, uh, Commissioner Rosine. Yes, that's a good clarification. When you do get the EIR, because I think the commission gets the final, is that correct? After the comments are back and forth, because they haven't seen it yet, but the traffic section, it's, a, it's comparing it to the gas station, excuse me, the car wash to the residential. It's a dramatic reduction in trips. Good clarification. Thank you. Commissioner Kleiman, did you want? Okay. Commissioner Ketting. Um, very good presentation. Um, I'd like the engineer or the architect to come up and talk sure. about the Anacapa access drive into the property. Commissioner, my name is Mark Nero. I'm the senior civil engineer on the project from Pusco Engineering. All right, very good. Like, we all understand, I hope, that how off Anacapa, the major you know guests and deliveries will come in there i i'm a bit confused i'm move, moving in with a moving van where is it going underneath the moving is it gonna stay there that kind of moving in would come off of the private irvine rent irvine uh, company drive on the south side and there's a pocket inside there for the back in off the traffic lanes and a loading dock in that area well I thought all deliveries were coming in where it says visitors entry. Fed FedEx, those guys would be at the front in, in their panel trucks. The, the larger moving vans would be off on the south side. So they'll come in underneath in that first lower level? They won't come underneath. It's out in front. Okay. I don't follow you. I'm reading that on the side street where, I, where it says residence entry, ingress, egress, underneath a raised terrace. You're saying right there? It's to the north. If you have a site plan, you can. There, where it says loading. Uh, right next to the street, first bay in, it should just go on the top side of the entry. I see it. Go back one, please. All right. Well, somewhere in there. Oh, they'll come in and back into there. They'll back in. Correct. Uh -huh. We've done turning studies quite a bit, and Irvine Company required all that also. Huh. Interesting. All right. Um, with keeping that same graphic up here, where the yellow arrow is, I understand there's cross easements on that private street, on that south side. Correct. And um, you're modifying it a little bit here for wider radius turning, I assume, for the trucks. Um, and the Irvine companies reviewed this and said it works for them, or do they have no say? They do have a say. It's their easement. Um, and they do have a say. It, it's, the easement belongs to the Irvine company for uh, walkway purposes. Uh, and I believe that indication has been that they don't object to reduction okay. of the easement. They're not using their entire easement. All right, and then show me where the property line is. Is it that light red line on that um, south side? Yes. That's the property line. That's the property line. All right, then the setbacks kick, kick in. All right. Um, last question, will there be any rooftop usage by the residents? Uh, no, not at all. There's an elevator overrun and just a few exhaust fans. All right. I should add that we've put the vast uh, majority of all the mechanical equipment at the first basement level. You see where it says mechanical one there. That's a portion of it. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a nice clean roof up there um, for the neighbors looking over. So Good idea. All right. Uh, let's see. No further questions at this time. Commissioner Elmore. Um, I guess my question would be with the same team that was just the up there. So I assume this is going to increase the pedestrian traffic. Is there, uh, can you just elaborate on the external lighting for nighttime, uh, 
walking at night? And, and is there a, an idea, or are you guys putting in, anything in place for pedestrian walkway, walking in the evening? We, we don't have a fully developed exterior lighting plan, to be honest. And, uh, but we do most of our work in Laguna, where it's, they're very sensitive. And so it would be down light, shielded, uh, you know, leaning towards dark sky compliant kind of lighting. Um, the vast majority of the pedestrians will be on Anacapa. Um, and that's taken care of by the normal street lighting by the city. Um, and then along this access, uh, currently it's serving the office buildings. Um, our residents be very unlikely that they'll be walking towards the back of house there. They'll be uh, most likely going down to their cars and exiting. If they're going to walk somewhere, they'd go out the front door uh, and use Anacapa. Um, so I, I imagine wall lighting, down lighting, sensitive to the neighbors here. Um, but I don't anticipate it, uh, many pedestrians at all. Okay. Maybe and next time. Of course, you come. the Irvine Company is an office building now, not with a, a lot of night uses, um, but that may change in the future. Okay. Maybe when you come back, you can just have a on the graph here. You can explain it. And then my next question. Um, this is something I brought up in another project lately. But everybody seems to have dogs. Do you have dedicated dog uh, zones? Have you guys thought about that? Is this a dog-friendly project? Can you elaborate? Good question. There's a dog. There's a dog uh, spot, which <laughs> down at the very south or the, middle, the bottom corner of the project, as it comes off screen. Just page down from that trash area. There's a, a tiny little dog park. For the residents' use. Page 27 of that, uh, those one blueprint prints. What street is that? What, what street is that off of? Is that the ingress, egress um, part? Off the private access drive, adjacent to the Irvine parcel. And I assume that's going to be lit thoroughly at night as well. I'm sorry. Sorry, I assume that you're going to have a, you have a lighting plan for that in the evening as well. Yeah, I'm assuming that'll be available at night as well. Yeah, all for right. sure. That's all my questions. Thanks. Any other questions, Commissioner Rosie? You can see oh, it there you. in the uh, bottom right of this image, kind of the, the yellow, yellow green corner there. Dog park. So along those lines, I think it's a really good point that maybe some sort of photometric would be something we could work on for the next time, just so that you know, dogs like to go at night too. So and there's access through here in front of where that drive would be. It seems like there's going to be pedestrians through that area and try to make that as pedestrian friendly as you can so that those people are protected when they're walking back and forth, because I think that's the access would be around. There, I saw some sort of egress along that southern, or excuse me, I think that's that the western side, the south on the, the, on the actual Towards the plan. bottom of the page would be the western side yes, adjacent to the... So I think I saw an egress out there, but I don't know if that was meant for just typical pedestrian or emergency use, but... In front more of that than drive that, would more, be that walkway is you can see it on the left side, which is it's gray there. That's on top of the podium. That's primarily a emergency uh, exit, um, but of course anybody could use it. So um, <clears throat> I know this is entirely subjective, but photorealistic re uh, elevations have gotten so much better that sometimes things get lost. And especially on A02, which is on page 11, 
your what I'm seeing here versus the the cladding that's on here has it feels very different. And I don't know, is it intended to have that kind of movement in the cladding or you don't pick it up on uh, A0.1, -O -A -O but you really do on A0.2. Something to consider. Or that colored stone. Uh, yeah, the two, the two uh, colored renderings, the darker stone reads, I mean, to be honest, reads a little heavy, a little like slump block, but it, uh, but it looks like it's, it's, it's a challenge because <laughs> you're so far away, you're not going to read a fine texture. So the, the mm -hmm. illustrator might have been a little heavy handed there. And, and I guess that's all I wanted to say was from a subjective perspective when you're looking at this and then looking at this board, and I do this a lot. This is one of those things where sometimes it feels you're not, it's not projecting what I think you want it to. Um, yeah, the intent is, the tint is a, a texture and you see the texture here. It's, it's, it's very it's, different. It's very that's... subtle. Um, but the challenge was the renderer wanted to show it with a little, um, a roughness to it, a texture. So it didn't appear quite as smooth as the, as the lighter, but Agreed. It doesn't. <laughs> yeah, and then the reason I'm bringing it up is if you look at it, you don't, you just don't pick up on it between on A01 and then on A02. It, all of a sudden, it starts to make you feel like the building is busy, and I don't think that was the intent, especially when I look at that board. So, it's a suggestion. Good point. Thank you, Commissioner Rosine, for bringing that up. I think that's a good point. And Commissioner Elmore and you both brought up a good point on the, uh, the, dog, the dog situation. So, C Cora, could you come up? I had a few questions I wanted to ask, too. Any other commissioner questions? I think the last time that this came up, there was some contention related to the Irvine Company on that, and Commissioner Ketting kind of asked, and just wanted to get kind of some stuff on the record. You, did you sit down with the, a consultant with the Roman company or how, how did that process work? Yes, there was a letter that came to the EIR on, I believe it was December 17th from the Irvine company uh, to the city. Uh, the city asked the applicant to respond to that letter, which was done in part by incorporating their issues into the EIR. They mainly were access issues and, and easement issues. And I think the majority of those comments have been answered in the environmental document. But I do have a call into um, Vice President Jeff Davis, who is in charge of entitlement now at the Irvine Company. And we do intend to meet with him again to make sure that they've reviewed all the documents and are, um, that we answer their questions. Good. Yeah, we, I, we don't want to be. We want to be sure that those issues are resolved. Yeah, I mean, any outstanding, especially with the dog run here. If that's you know in that area where people may be going in and out to other buildings within the Irvine Company you know, properties, if that's not safe and something does happen, that you know who's the responsible party? The driver likely, but you know that person is likely going to something in the Irvine Company. So that, that I could see some concerns related to that and just kind of the overall how that whole little area and that wing there has. So just to make sure you get stuff on the record with them so that they're in full support of this because I know that last time that that was, that was a challenge. Yeah, I think we're in much better position, but we still need to, I think, have another meeting. Yeah, I think Commissioner Ketting and I are the only two that were remaining commissioners during that time. Um, another issue that did come up during that, that last time was the, uh, the fact that there's three neighboring CUPs that have existing two 2 a.m. hours. So um, Muldoon's is an institution. They have a significant amount of uh, live music when it's allowed, which is hopefully soon. Um, but they have uh, St. Patrick's Day. They have lines. They have patios. They have smoking. You know, they have things that um, are more geared towards uh, night um, activity. So um, I've heard the discussion of um, generous balconies and large patio windows. I don't want to see 
calls for service once residents move in there and bog down PD when they knew what they were getting into when they made the purchase. So is there something that you plan to do for those um, new owners? You know, is there um, some type of uh, disclosure, you know, on title or something that says, and have you worked with the owners or the um, occupants of those three sites? So Red O, Fig and Olive, and Muldoon's. Well, as you know, there's a new owner of Muldoon's, which was just here a minute ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's actually, Mario does own Muldoon's, and that's a, a delight for us because the previous owner was um, rather difficult. So we have already talked to Mario. He is welcoming, wel welcoming us with open arms to this neighborhood to have residential here. He's very used, as an operator, as you heard, he's very used to mixed-use um, communities. Um, this isn't the peninsula, obviously, but we will do everything we can to, and we'll come back with a language that would be put into CCNRs to make sure that the residents know that in that location they are moving into a mixed-use community that does have um, Muldoon's next to it and Fig and Olive and Red O across the street. Don't think the Red O and Fig and Olive are as quite of the relationship because that's a... It's a six-lane street, Newport Boulevard, between them, Newport Center Drive, and those residents. But Muldoon's is a little bit closer. Yeah, I think they have they have sometimes live music or like a DJ of some sort. So I don't know how loud that gets. But uh, you know, make sure that there's you know triple pane windows and you know sound attenuation. I think would be important to have that. And perhaps in the C or the CUP or at least the language should conditions. You know, um, we can have something that talks about uh, the fact that the, there's something on title or some type of disclosure. But yeah, I would I would make Point. sure you, you work out you know those details with uh, Mario uh, because if you heard him mention, he did say um, that uh, he requires it with his tenants, mm -hmm. you know that they know what they're getting into when they do. So I think it's important to have a discussion, especially um, with him, uh, especially since he's he's closest. Um, uh, a couple other questions: um, Did that car wash at one time have gasoline sales on it? Yes, I believe it did. So that is something that has to get mitigated? I think it's already been done, but I would ask, I don't know if Mr. Ridgeway wanted to comment on that. Gas tanks? Oh. Okay. It's been mitigated. I think the staff talked about that uh, earlier, but um, it will be addressed, obviously, in the EIR, and I guess there still is gas. I mean, I knew there was gas service there. Gotcha. And then when you say less traffic generated because there won't be people going to the car wash, but at some point the residents in the area will need a car wash to go to. This uh, <laughs> commission had a discussion on car washes, and the council overrid this decision, but uh, you know they're, they're, that's something this community is now going to be lacking that's a first world problem it's not you know an amazing you know loss of anything but it, the residents do frequent it so you know those folks will travel someplace else and perhaps further to other communities uh, which will be impactful uh, to the streets so stating that it's less traffic isn't necessarily maybe for this specific site but for the general purposes of uh, residents nearby that do frequent that uh, location they will now have to travel further to find a car wash so um, and then my only other issue was with the stonework as well that uh, Commissioner Rosine brought up. But I, to me, it looks like something where you plant a bunch of succulents and they hang, you know, like that, that's to me what that looked like. So as long as that gets addressed, I think it just kind of stands out a little too much. But I, I think what Commissioner Rosine was saying is, I think, what really happened there. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other? Yeah, Commissioner Rosine. I'm sorry, just one more quick question. This is probably best for staff, and maybe it's Tony, but the... Since this entry is so close to Newport Center Drive and turning movements, is there any concern about that? I haven't seen the, the EIR, but the way that those turning movements are in and out, so you've got, are they gonna be restricted in any way or is it, you, it's, a, it's a new entry, so are there any concerns about that? Yes, no, we've reviewed it as we've, the site plan's have been uh, submitted, and, and I don't have any concerns with the, the traffic movements on and off Anacapa. Anacapa is a very lightly traveled roadway, very low volume, so, so I'm not, I don't have the concerns with access on Anacapa. Okay, thanks. 
Any other commissioner comments? Okay, I will, uh, oh, yes, Commissioner Kenny. What are the next steps in their process? Wait out the EIR review until June? That's correct, I can answer that question. Um, so once the public review period has closed, June 14th for the EIR, we'll prepare the final EIR with the responses to comments, and then we anticipate a planning commission hearing where you can make a decision in August of this year. Thank you. Okay, I will open up the public hearing, and um, again, this there is no vote being taken tonight, um, and if you're watching from home, it's 949 two seven zero eight one six five and I'll go to Mr. Mosier in the council chambers and anyone else. Uh, thank you, Chair Weigand. I just had uh, two two brief comments. Uh, first, I certainly appreciate the reduction in bulk compared to the earlier proposal you saw some years ago for the same site. Uh, much has been said tonight about how this is compatible with the adjacent planned community of block 100. And while it's true that that is not in the site plane, I want to be sure that the commissioners appreciate that 50 feet and 10 feet additional for architectural appurtenances was not the original vision for Block 100. It is not how the rest of Block 100 is currently constructed. And the original vision, as I understand it, which was the vision until just a very few years ago, was, I believe it was limited to 32 feet, so that from, I assume, the reason being so that from Fashion Island, you had a clear view from the higher elevation looking down on a slant to the water beyond. Uh, it, <clears throat> the, the increase from what it was previously, I think 32 feet to 50, was kind of introduced without any public knowledge that that was being done in some uh, larger amendment to the Newport Center planned community text. And it was just barely mentioned kind of in a inner page of some staff report that that was being changed. And nobody seeing the agenda item knew that that was happening at the time. And it has not yet come to fruition. So it's... Uh, saying it's compatible is perhaps compatible with that, but not with the original vision for Block 100. And then second, uh, the staff was asked if this helped with the arena allocation that we have. It certainly does, but these are luxury condominiums. They, they help with the luxury above market component, which is not a component that we have any trouble with and they do not help at all towards the affordable housing need, which is the big one and the problematic one. So those are my two comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mosier. Any other comments in the chamber? How about on the phone? There's no others. Okay. I guess um, I can bring it back to the commission to ask any further questions. Commissioner Rosine? I apologize. I meant to ask this earlier and I get hung up with the building heights, but there's the, the datum line on A8, handwritten page 19. And it shows the sort of a projection of a line. At least I think that's the line. It's in red that talks about how the height is defined. And I thought I read this building was 53 feet high, but now I'm looking at it and I I heard 59, and looking at this, I see 59 and 68 on either side. I wonder if maybe we could discuss how that's how that dimension is established. I can speak first to the establishment of grade, and then perhaps Glenn would like to speak to the total height. Um, in terms of established grade, uh, we use the methodology that's used in the neighboring planned community. So as you know, this is a planned community, so they will be establishing their own regulations, but we thought it made sense to utilize the surrounding um, neighborhoods regulations for measuring height. So what we've done is establish the height from sort of a middle point of the finished grades from North Newport, uh, from Newport Center Drive, and then we measure the height up from there. The datum that you see, it's similar to mean sea level, which you'd probably see more often, but the city does use a different datum, and so that's the elevation that we'll be measuring height from.
we we worked with Jim Campbell to uh, establish a datum, and the the methodology was uh, the the grade outside of the main entry was treated as the datum. In this case, uh, one seventy one sixty seven point seven five. In in fact, on the previous previous um, uh, submittals for this site. Um, the datum was actually higher, um, closer to 170, I believe. Um, but we measure all the heights from that, uh, that grade right outside the front entry. And we, we uh, staff was conservative. They actually took the grade at the bottom of the stairs. So there's, there's a couple stairs up to the main entry. So um, it's, it's a fairly conservative height datum. And it, as it relates to building height, maybe we could explain how that how that works. I think the discrepancy is between the edge of the architectural projection versus the little um, bump out that goes a little bit higher, and then from there you have the elevator overrun. So there's several different heights that are being measured here. Yeah, I guess I was just having a hard time figuring out how it came up with a certain number as the building height. I see multiple ones, so. Just so the, 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 official, the official height in terms of planning is always measured from the datum. I, I apologize for all the numbers there, but they were necessary, but it is confusing. So the height of the roof structure is 5211, and we usually round it off to 53 when we're talking about it. So the, we're, there are, the, the dimension string is from that horizontal datum line of 167.75 to the roof. Now we do exceed that at the elevator overrun, which is allowed. Um, and we we're, we're, are trying to keep our overrun within seven feet of that basic roof height. So in round numbers, we're 53 feet high with a seven, seven foot overrun. Okay, thank that you. Helps. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'll spend some time with that. Any other commissioner comments? All right, Cora, I'm going to bring you back up one more time. I'm sorry to bring this one back up again, but when you said you, you talked to Mario at Muldoon's, did you talk to him or did somebody else talk to him? Cora Newman, Mr. Ridgeway, and we we are going to have a meeting with him. But but he it, is aware of this proposal. But when you said kind of that it was a blessing, you know, or or that he no, signed off, did, did did can you confirm if if you've you've had initial discussions, but have they proved fruitful? That's my understanding. But we will continue. When, by the time we come back here, we will know that a hundred percent for sure. Yeah, I think that that's really important. That that gets hammered out because there was a significant petition the last time that uh, this was up that uh, Mr. Schwartz, who owned the prior, but I, I, you know, I think that there, that concern still exists and, um, you know, we're, we're putting residents in an area that could have impacts. So I'm, I'm sensitive to PD. I don't need them to be showing <laughs> up and, you know, call, coming out to something that the residents should have already been well aware of. So, of course, and I don't think the uh, owner of Muldoon's wants to have uh, a negative record showing that, you know, his patrons have uh, contributed to, to noise issues. So I think that just needs to get flushed out. Of course, pretty seriously. So that's just the one my... thing good about Muldoon's, as you know, is that their entertainment is completely enclosed. That's the beauty of that building. The courtyard is has building all the way around it. There is no open uh, facility for entertainment in that in Muldoon's except the open air at the top at the top it's an open air but the the, the building shields sure the that that courtyard but lines can form people can smoke doors open in and out too so you know there is there is some issues that just need to get flushed out so thank you that's all I have okay any other uh, commissioners and okay nobody on the phone right we're closed public hearing okay all right move on to our next item is that correct Okay, we'll take a couple minute uh, break just so that the uh, boards can get cleaned up and
commissioners can take a restroom break, staff can take a restroom break.